Assalamu alaikum friends, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we are going to see a comparison between the for each and the normal for loop in Kotlin. Let's get started. So as always, we have here a simple project. So in Kotlin, usually we have two kinds of for loops you can do. So let's get started. So for example, we can do for one to 10, for example, this kind of range, zero. Here, what we can do, we can do for, for normal for here, for example, I in this kind of thing, and then we can print, print something. Or if you have a collection, you can use this kind of thing, like following, and do this kind of an it range to do normal for each. So this is the same thing, like here we are using the i, and here we are using the it to the dollar like that, and dot. This will produce the same results. Let's see. All right, so I didn't use println. As you can see, one, two, three, two, until 10. Okay, 10 will get printed, and the other will get printed also. So this is a simple example. But why in Kotlin we have two things? Why we don't have only this or why we don't have only this? Well, first of all, because for each, we can use for each with collection in order to achieve that functional side. Because like for each, we have like more consistent API, like map, filter, sort, and do many other things. So the for each is kind of an addition to that functional side, to keep that functional side. That's the first thing. Well, first of all, let's take a look at the decompiled code. I always love to see the decompiled code. If you show the decompiled code here, for this class, and do decompile, we have two loops, this one, and then we have the other one. So this is the first loop, this is the second. So the first loop, as you can see, you are just replacing it with a byte, okay? This kind of optimization can be an int, can be anything. Then we do normal for loop, we will increase and stop, print, that's all. But in the for h, we have many things happening here. So it will create this iterable object, so this is a problem. If you have like many, many for each's, you will have to create many, many these things. Then for each false, okay. Then we will have this iterator. Then we are doing a while. This iterator has next. So this is how the int range work because of the int range. If you are going to choose another type of format, let's say a list, it will be different. We will see that in a minute. And then we will iterate, loop, and print. That's it. This will produce a problem if you have many, many for each's happening in our app. We'll see that in a minute. But now, let me just convert this to a list before doing it, because I'm trying to loop over a list. I'm not trying to loop over an int range. Let's say I'm having a list of one, two, and three. And if I do the decompile code right now, you will see that I have, uh, okay, so it always chooses that collection list and work on it. So it is the same with lists. If it is the same with the same thing like with normal array, let me check, let's say one, two, three, and decompile it. For this kind of thing, it's going to use the form. It's not going to use like the while. So because the same thing, it's still creating those objects here. Well, the creation of the object is necessary in order to pass it, but this is the thing. So as I said, this will produce like an extra performance. Let's try to compare the performance. Like, so here is this code. I'm trying to use measure time millis like this. It will measure that code. What you will try to do is we'll try to loop one million times. We we'll just update the variable like that using the for loop and using the for each loop. This is kind of identical. So we will see how this will affect it. Let's run it right now. And here we go. For each will take eight milliseconds and two, and the for will take two milliseconds. If we increase that to let's say one billion times, that way we can see the difference because sometimes the computer is very fast to produce problem. And well, we have to wait. As you can see, the for each is taking more time, like extra 100 milliseconds. Well, 100 millisecond isn't much because even if you have 1 billion loops like that, 1 billion for loop like the following, it won't be the problem because the result will be only 100 milliseconds. But the idea is that we're talking about how you compare both. For the for each, there is another problem without it, which is the break and the continue. Well, normally in the for loop, what you can do, you can continue. Continue means skip this iteration, go to the next iteration, and the break will stop the iteration. And some condition will stop completely the loop and directly go here to the next line. We can do that normal with for loop, but with for each is a little bit tricky because let's say that I'm having this for each from one to 10. And if you just print it, it will print just from one to 10 as normal. So here it is. I want kind of a condition that will, for example, skip something. If you want to skip a number, you want to process it, for example, you can do this one. If it's equal to six, for example, you can continue. You can continue using the return to for each. You can return to for each. And if you run it, it won't break. It will continue. 
This is the behavior of continuous. You can see we won't have the six, one, two, five, and directly seven. But if you want the break, we don't have the break. What you can do is that you can directly return like the following. But if you return, this will mean to return to the function. If you are, let's say you, are, you have another code here and you want to execute it, you want to be able to do that. Hello, after the break. And if you run this, as you can see, it will stop at six, it will break at six, it won't do it, but it will stop completely the flow because we are returning function. So the idea in order to achieve that breaking behavior is a little bit trickier. First of all, we will try to run a function like the following, and we will run this, as you can see, but this is kind of lambda thing. But here, what we want to return, we want to return to this one. We kind of try to do the go to or the jump. So here, let's just name it like the loop for the following. And here we will set it to return to the loop. So when it will execute, it will go to the loop directly, it will jump. And once it is finished, it will go here. If you run it right now, you see the difference. So as you can see one, two, three, five, and then we can have hello after the break. So this is a trick in order to achieve the behavior of the break using the for each, because sometimes you have to use that for each and you have to break from it. Well, as I said, in the for normal for, you can break and continue, but here in the for each, you have to use the return to the for each, like following, using this one, it will jump here and it will continue. But if you do the return, it will completely go back to the function. If you have nothing here, you can do that. It's not a problem, as long as it is terminating the current function it, it is in. Currently, I'm in the main. But if you want to continue the flow, you know, I mean, stop the for each and continue the flow, you have simply to do to the loop. While this, you can name it anything. It doesn't have to be do, but try to have standard thing. So this is it for this mixed video. So we did the comparison between the performance for for each and normal for. We saw that this is required for the functional aspect of Kotlin, like many other functional things. We saw that the performance for each is a little bit, just a little bit more because it is kind of creating an object, it reports and everything. And you saw we can use the break, the continue with the for each as it is not natively supported directly here because it can't be supported directly here. There is, we need some extra mechanism like jumping around this target thing. So thanks a lot for watching this video to the end. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and see you in the next videos. Salam alaikum.